Hello, chemistry. As you may or may not recall, I got my undergraduate degree, my bachelor's degree from a small school in Indiana called DePaul University. And DePaul University has a student body of around 2,000 students. It is in the middle of nowhere in Greencastle, Indiana, which is uh, west of Indianapolis, southeast of Chicago, Illinois, and is literally in the middle of farms. Um, not really close to a lot of anything, but it's a, it's a fairly well-known school and uh, has close ties to Eli Lilly Pharmaceutical, which was headquartered in Indianapolis. And the um, particularly the chemistry and the biology departments are very strong at DePaul. I'd like to think the geology department was fairly strong as well, but uh, at the time I was there, it was uh, much smaller in terms of the number of students that were there. And I um, spent almost all my time as a student in a building called the Julian Science and Math Center. And I'll fully admit that when I was a student there, I never really looked deeply into the history of the building's namesake, which is uh, Percy Julian. But in the years since I graduated, I have learned the story of Percy Julian, and it becomes probably one of the most uh, influential stories for me in terms of understanding really what the history is of the field of science, particularly in the United States in the 20th century. And like most things that we study in recent American history, uh, really in all fields of history, there are the impacts of the society at the time projected onto the more objective sort of day-to-day -day activities or you know, the objective field of science. And so the main topic in considering the story of Percy Julian is that Percy Julian was a black man in America, which at the time of much of his life was a racially unfriendly nation uh, we're going through Jim Crow era of segregation all the way up through the, the civil rights movement and everything in between. And so Percy Julian comes out of Alabama and his grandmother was a freed slave. Um, and, you know, there was, there was a lot of, um, you know, reconstruction building of uh, communities um, in that time, and, and really the African Americans, the Blacks, were not necessarily central to that. And so you have Percy Julian, who is a youngster in Alabama, and he basically, if he wanted to go to school, he could go to school till about eighth grade, and then that was it, you were done. There was no, you know, what we would call high school for Blacks in the South, and certainly college was, you know, out of the question. Uh, there were a few traditionally or predominantly black schools in the country, uh, Fisk and Howard and a few other schools. But really, uh, the expectation was, and this is, there's a, a PBS video that I had linked to in the assignment for this, but you know, the expectation of blacks in the South was you'd get just enough education to be a maid or be a servant or be a construction worker or, or a laborer or something like that and no more, because that was seen as your, your role in society. Um, Percy Julian's father had higher expectations than that for him, I think. His father really um, had interest in life science in particular, and, and he and Julian used to uh, walk a lot in the woods. Percy Julian, in his, in his memoirs, tells the story of one time when he was a child uh, walking in the woods, and... Um, he came across the, a lynch body hanging in a tree and um, on the same walk in the woods encountered uh, a rattlesnake, which is, you know, uh, rattlers are not that uncommon in the South, but, you know, you have this kind of traumatic event of seeing a, a body hanging from a, a noose in a tree and, and the rattlesnake. And he kind of developed this association of, you know, racial injustice in white America with, with the rattlesnake, which is an interesting um, analogy to kind of consider as a thought experiment. But um, so he he finishes what school he can 
and through uh, a program that DePaul University had in Indiana, he was able to be accepted to go to school there. So he travels up to DePaul University, you know, travels by train in those days, and he gets there and is like, you know, hi, I'm Percy Julian, I'm here to go to school. And they're kind of like, all right, one, um, you only made it to eighth grade, so the first thing you're going to have to do is take remedial classes. Uh, and, oh, you're going to have to do that at the same time you're taking your normal classes. So essentially he has a double course load of makeup classes and new classes at the same time. And the second thing they say is, oh, by the way, um, we, we don't have any housing for you. And um, you're gonna, so you're going to kind of have to be on your own. And also the town doesn't allow black people to stay in it overnight. So here's Julian, you know, with all these hopes of showing up to college. And he gets there to find out he doesn't have a place to live. He's going to have to do double the work of every other student. And he's going to have to um, f find a way to, to get food, pay for things. So he ends up getting a position at a fraternity there, the, the Sigma Chi fraternity. And they allow him to essentially be a um, you know butler and, and maintenance guy, worker at the, the house. They let him live in the basement. Uh, so that is you know, kind of a, a little bit thrown in his direction. And he ends up uh, attending his classes, does all the makeup work, and he graduates first in his class at DePaul University. So, you know, think of having to, to do two schools at once, uh, living in a, in a small spot in a basement, being a servant for the people you were living with, but yet managing to work your way to graduate first in your class. That in itself is a um, is, a, is an important point to consider what type of person he truly was. Uh, not only how talented he was, but also in this whole process of, of already being told, you can't do it, you can't do it because you're black. He develops this drive to say, you're, you're not going to tell me I can't. So he has it in his mind that he wants to be uh, one of the first uh, black chemists in the country to get his PhD. And that is kind of unheard of. So he bounces around between some um, teaching positions a little bit in, in other black schools. He finally gets a chance to come to uh, Harvard to here in Boston. And he works and gets his master's degree at Harvard and um, wants to go on for his PhD. And once again, he's told, you know, um, don't you think you've had enough? And so again, he, he bounces around jobs, still hoping for his PhD. He lands back at DePaul. Oddly enough, they uh, give, he gets a position as a research associate and, and part-time instructor at DePaul. Um, he, you know, develops some friendships. He was brought in by a professor uh, named William Blanchard, who really takes him under his wing and becomes a proponent for him. So he's, He's, you know, being told you can't do these things because you're black. And then he's got, you know, white people as well that are coming in and saying, you know, hey, we see your talent. We see what you're doing. Come in. We, we want to work with you. We, we, we want you to be part of our team. So there's, there's this juxtaposition between individual people that are really seeing the, the talent and have the love your neighbor kind of attitude. And then you have the systematic racism that kind of every time he gets to the top, he kind of gets smacked down. So uh, he's working at the PAW, he's doing research, and he uh, gets into this idea of total organic synthesis. And so organic synthesis is used when there's some natural chemical uh, where you could go out and, you know, find it as an extract from a flower or something like that. And instead of extracting it from the organism, which a lot of times these chemicals in plants are only there in very small trace amounts. Uh, I saw one example about another synthesis that said in order to get um, 10 grams of this one organic compound out of tree bark, you'd need to harvest a thousand tons of trees in order to get 10 grams of this substance from it. So that's going to make the chemical very unavailable to people. It's going to make it extremely expensive. That's a lot of natural resources. So what chemists would like to do is to take smaller, readily available building blocks, say from corn or from soybeans or something like that, 
and be able to assemble them into these very complex uh, organic molecules. So Julian was involved in that, uh, had a great breakthrough uh, publication where he conducted a, a uh, organic synthesis from a, from a bean called a calabar bean to produce physostigmine, which is a, a medicinal compound. And um, it was great because in, if you watch the PBS video, the, the final test, the final thing that he did to prove that he had discovered it was a melting point test, not unlike what we did in lab, where you take a sample of it, you put it in a, in a tube, you heat it, you want to see the point at which it melts, you determine that melting point, and that was the key diagnostic test that he had created the substance that he thought he had. He was competing against another scientist, and that scientist, he discovered, had incorrectly determined the melting point, and Julian had kind of put his whole career on the line by calling out this other scientist, and that one test of melting point was what was either going to make or break his career. So here he is at the PAW, and... Um, he has this great, you know, discovery, lots of publications and all of that. And, uh, he's like, all right, you know, how about a full-time job? And job says, well, you know, we've got a lot of white students and we're not sure they really want a, a black person teaching them. So once again, DePaul, my alma mater, um, turns their back on Percy Julian. So all was not lost. Um, Percy Julian, again, goes back to doing some teaching at these uh, historically black universities, which were, which were grossly underfunded. He really is reported to have been extremely annoyed by the lack of resources in the laboratories at some of these schools. And uh, today, it's not that way. They're, they're some of, the, some of the, the, the greatest research institutions in the country now. But you know, at the time, we'll, we're still back in the you know, 1940s, um, and it's still a very uh, racially segregated country at that point. So Julian manages to uh, connect with a research fellowship in Vienna, Austria. He goes to Vienna, and um, you know the, the the racial climate's very different in Europe. And he came over instead of being an outcast. He came over kind of as a novelty, and everybody wanted him to be a part of their lives. So he um, studies on under a, an extremely well-known um, organic chemist out there. He gets his PhD um, in the process in this kind of period of time. He had um, met a woman, Anna, that would later become his wife. Um, it's a bit of a soap opera story there in that she actually was uh, married to one of his research associates um, when they first met. And... Um, so <laughs> Percy Julian was no, was no angel, but, um, you know, he's, he's makes mistakes like, like all of us, but, you know, eventually they did, um, they did, uh, end up getting married. There was a little bit of an issue that, uh, the, the research associate that he essentially stole her from, um, essentially carried out the 1930s version of a social, social media smear campaign. He had, written her some rather uh, detailed love letters from uh, Vienna, uh, along with kind of his exploits of, of partying and things in Vienna. And uh, those, he, the, the research associate got a hold of those and published them and kind of smear his reputation. So that, that worked against Julian when he came back to the United States a little bit um, in that he, he, you know, it's like a, like, posting something in that you shouldn't have on Twitter or Facebook. Julian got himself into a little bit of trouble with that. But eventually he got into a position of, you know, being a respected PhD chemist and he goes looking for jobs. Um, kind of had decided at this point that he was tired of the American university system telling him what he could and couldn't do, could and could not do. So he wanted to go into industry and he starts looking for jobs and, uh, you know, he applies and you can imagine on, on paper, uh, Percy Julian looks amazing. He's got a bachelor's degree from DePaul, a master's degree from Harvard, a PhD from the University of Vienna, all these publications. He submits his resume. They say, hey, come in for an interview. And he walks in the door and they go, oh, you're black. Well, sorry. And I think one of the quotes in the video is, 
Now, while we've never hired a black chemist, I'm not sure how that would work out. Um, you know, so this was, and a lot of his work was in the Midwest, so Illinois, Wisconsin, that area, because um, you know there was a lot of industry there at the time, and and that was a region of the country was somewhat familiar with coming out of the paw. But he ends up again a um, uh, a white business owner um, with the Glidden Corporation, um, recognizes the talent and overlooks the race issue and, and hires him. And so he goes to work for Glidden. Glidden at the time was largely a paint company, but this was at a time when plastic was becoming the thing. And um, the other thing that is a thing in the Midwest is soybeans. And so Glidden tasked uh, Percy Julian with trying to figure out everything he could about soybeans. And um, so Glidden worked on everything from a, a firefighting foam that was used heavily in World War II to certain types of plastics. Um, but then there was an issue, and, and sort of the, the story is that his, his wife had a miscarriage. And there are certain hormones that essentially tell a woman that she is um, tell her woman's body that, you know, hey, you're pregnant and you need to do these things to keep your your uh, baby alive. And if those hormone levels aren't right, then the body can, uh, you know, making a very complex story uh, simpler, but essentially the body can forget that it's pregnant. So he recognized that he could, um, that, you know, there were medications to treat this, but they were extremely difficult to get. And there were some of these, you know, natural extracts. So he worked on a process to synthesize um, that hormone and was able to do it. And the next thing you know, Glidden is getting into the, the pharmaceutical manufacturing. He ends up coming up with the method to ef efficiently synthesize cortisone. And cortisone, you know, if you hear about athletes, you know, running into the locker room because they were hurt at halftime of a game and they come out magically feeling better. You know, the legend of that is getting cortisone shots. I've had a few cortisone shots in my shoulder and in my back. Um, cortisone greatly reduces inf inflammation and swelling and pain and helps speed healing. Um, so cortisone was seen as a treatment for arthritis where, you, where your, your joints actually begin to attack themselves and break down. So he didn't you know, discover these substances or, you know, invent them. You can't really invent natural products, but didn't discover them. But he figured out how to make them from simple building blocks such that they could go to the masses. They could be affordable uh, and easily produced for people to get. So he continues this work at Glidden. This is up in Chicago. And, you know, he's making money. He's got a wife. He's got kids at this point. Um, and so they, you know, buy a house and they buy a house in what's known as the Oak Park uh, neighborhood of Chicago. And um, I'm trying to figure out like in the Boston area what the neighborhood would be like, but it's, you know, it's a, I get the impression it's kind of a Cambridge or it's a, it's a Brookline. It's described as one of those communities that feels it's a little better than everybody else. And so he buys this house and gets ready to move in. And uh, just before he gets ready to move in, somebody sets the house on fire. Um, and somebody throws a rock through the window, you know, you know, expletive, get out. We don't want you here. Things like that. Um, things calm down a little bit and he goes out of tent, you know, his wife, he and his wife go out to dinner or something like that, leave the kids at home and somebody throws a stick of dynamite against the house. And, you know, fortunately it bounces off the brick, but it, um, you know, he really took it personally. It was the point at which the 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 racially motivated setbacks were not just against him, but it was against his family. And his son talks about one of his most um, memorable, mo memorable moments with his father, and his father worked long hours. His father really was obsessed by his work. But once this happened, Percy Julian stayed home more. Um, and, you know, his son talked about one of the most, most memorable moments was sitting out in the front yard overnight with his dad with a shotgun just in case anybody came along to threaten his family and they would sit there and they would have long talks about you know racism in America and history and, and all of these things and you know he would ask the son would ask you know why uh, why do people do this and 
Percy would just reply, stupidity, and you know, things like that. So eventually the the neighborhood of Oak Park did set up or did step up. Um, there was both a petition published and a, and a march um, in support of Julian and, and things did calm down after a while. And the, the Julian house is still there. If you, you know, you can search it out on Google Maps and, and things like that. And, you know, it really was, I think that was, there was a point at which Julian reached such a pinnacle that the systematic racism couldn't hold him back anymore. It was still there, but uh, he eventually went on to found his own company, um, Julian Labs, uh, you know, continue the process of, of developing the building blocks for organic synthesis. He ended up selling this company for the equivalent of $20 million to uh, Upjohn Pharmaceutical. He was uh, given all sorts of medals, uh, the Spingard Medal, which is one of the most prestigious, prestigious uh, medals that's out there. He was voted to the National Academy of Sciences, which is essentially the American Scientific Honor Society. He received, I think, 19 honorary PhDs and even had a, a postage stamp uh, made in his honor. So, um, but this is a story that, that carries all the way into 1975. He passed away from cancer in 1975. And so what I realized is that means that, that Percy Julian and I were both alive at the same time, which means his story of struggles, his story of racism, his, his story of, you know, the way America treated him is something that is not in the distant past. And it's something that, you know, his, his son, I think his son, uh, last, um, I think his son's still alive. And, um, uh, 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 so his son passed away a few years ago. His daughter, Faith, is still alive. So these are, you know, you had an experience of your, your house being firebombed because of your race, and you are still alive today. That means that um, these events, along with, you know, the events that we've experienced in our lifetimes and you've experienced in your lifetimes and you've experienced within the past year, are still part of this. But, you know, in the study of history, a lot of times you look to the people that are um, the leaders, the, the path layers, the groundbreaking people in it. And in terms of science, the sciences, and in terms of chemistry, Percy Julian absolutely is one of those. And um, somebody that was able to, through extreme perseverance and effort and uh, an unwillingness to be told what he can't do, fought against a system that was really at every turn seemingly trying to work against him. Um, DePaul later bestowed him with lots of honors. DePaul is definitely a different school than it was um, when Julian was there. Um, they are, uh, you know, they, they named the building in his honor. That's where I studied. Um, if you go in there, a little picture from a visit I had a couple of years ago, there's a, a bust of Percy Julian as you walk in the door and there's the this, this Spingarn medal and a little display there. It's kind of cool right off to the side of his bust. They have an actual periodic table, meaning a periodic table with samples of all of the elements, uh, except for the ones that, that are highly radioactive and would be hazardous to be near but uh, so that's kind of cool. And they even have a full replica of his home office that you can use to go in. Um, the PAW has this series of, of study and reflection rooms uh, around campus where you can go in, you can just sit and do readings or things like that. And so one of these rooms is a, is a replica of Percy Julian's office. So I, I kind of kicked myself a little bit and that I didn't learn more about him there. Uh, or when I was there, but I since have made it a point to learn his story and um, reflect on how that story, you know, specific to organic chemistry, but really representative of um, an ongoing period of American history in which systematic racism and racial biases and things like that have been a, have been and are uh, a reality in a lot of cases. So, you know, things are not the same as they were then, uh, obviously, but I do want to pose a question that's going to be the follow-up activity to this and a discussion on Blackboard, and that's going to be, so what if 
instead of Percy Julian having been born uh, when he was, what if he had born in, been born in a modern time? Let's say, what if Percy Julian was, you know, say closer to my age? Um, what would his experience have been like potentially? So uh, we'll consider that. I'll give you a little more details on the prompt in, uh, in the assignment, but that's the story of Percy Julian. Again, I invite you to watch the, the PBS video. It's a couple hours long though, so I didn't want to put that on you for this assignment, but I I really believe it's important, and this is something that I've done every year uh, this time of year as we go through uh, Martin Luther King Day and then in the Black History Month that every year I've taught, I have wanted to present the story of uh, Percy Julian to my students because I think it's an extremely important uh, story to have heard.